So here we are, sharing secrets of the soil with me, your host, Regen Ray. Hello, soil lovers, and welcome to another episode of Secrets of the Soil. I'm your host, Regen Ray, and today my guest needs no introduction because it is the one, Fred Provenza. Welcome to the Secrets of the Soil. Thank you very much, Ray. Wonderful to be with you and all the soil lovers out there. Absolutely. I'm excited to get our hands dirty and our minds into the soil and the conversation wherever it goes today. But for those who have not discovered who you are, Fred, give them a really quick glimpse into who you are and how you fit into the ecosystem of soil and health and well-being. Sure. I uh, come from a state called Colorado. The, the Rocky Mountains of Colorado was born and raised there. A uh, huge interest in anything wild and free, uh, creatures of all sorts, from insects to birds, fishes, mammals. That led to uh, working in wildlife biology, an undergrad degree in wildlife biology. At the same time I was going to school at Colorado State University, I was also working on a ranch in Colorado. I spent seven years there, uh, two years after I graduated from Colorado State University running the ranch. At that time, I thought a lot about what I wanted to do, quote, when I grew up and thought research would be interesting. So I applied to graduate school and went to Utah State University, where I worked on master's and PhD degrees, and then spent a career of 35 years working there on behavioral ecology of plants and animals, basically, and that linked in, of course, with soils and so forth. And so what are the animals telling us? Your book, uh, Nourished, is definitely a true testament to that, and uh, I feel like you've shed an amazing amount of light on observing animals and 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 kind of interpreting their wisdom, what, what, what led you to that point and what have you, you know, been able to share with the world through that process? Well, I think the, and I, the, one of the reasons I mentioned the background in wildlife biology and the, and the working on the ranch was the, the time spent observing animals, watching what they do and wondering why they do what they do. Why do they eat the foods they do? Why do they go to the places they go? Uh, seasonally and so forth, just led to, to, a, to an intense curiosity about food and habitat selection in animals. And then when I went to Utah State University, what I really would have liked to have studied was wild mountain goats foraging in alpine environments with diverse array of species. Well, I ended up studying domestic goats foraging on this shrub called blackbrush. <laughs> it was like, at the onset, I thought, what could be more boring? But it was a project anyway, using these goats as mobile pruning machines to stimulate uh, gro re new growth on, on this shrub blackbrush. But as it turns out, there couldn't have, in my view, looking back, there couldn't have been a better uh, study for me to be on because I... I learned so much watching those goats and watching black brush in relation to the goats. You know, these we were using the goats as mobile pruning machines to uh, during the winter time, prune it in the prune the shrub in the winter, stimulates new growth in the spring and summer. And that new growth we knew was higher in energy, protein, minerals. It was better forage, we thought, but the goats, most of the goats didn't want to eat it. So that was the first thing. So what, what's going on? Uh, and we spent several years then trying to understand, well, why don't the goats want to eat that? And what we learned is that, you know, resources are valuable out there in the arid so uh, southwest, um, moisture, nutrients, sunlight. And so black brush were when it makes an investment in a new twig, it protects that twig. And the way it does that is chemically by putting very high concentrations of compounds called tannins in that. So we were learning about the behavior of the plants and about the behavior of the animals. And many, many observations like that, that you probably don't need to go into for time's sake now, but simply observing what creatures are doing and then thinking about that and then doing studies led to many, many insights that I was being taught by plants and animals about how they work and the nutritional, the nutritional, the wisdom of plants and animals, actually. Yeah, that's so amazing. I've, I've heard a lot where people, even inventors in the past, would go out into nature and then have this like idea that popped out of nowhere. And I think being in nature, seeing the systems work so naturally and beautifully can wire new pathways in our brain to 
um, solve problems that we can't necessarily do at our desk or on a tractor or in an office or, you, you know, when we, we, we want to do it. And, um, and I think that observation is something that we've really lost as a group of people. We don't stop and slow down and quote unquote, do nothing. You know, it seems to be bad in this hustle culture that we do nothing and relax, but sitting there and just observing can give us so many feedback loops was that something that you were aware of initially, or did you accidentally stumble into that when you started your research? You know, just to add a comment before I answer the question, I think you're so absolutely right on with what you're talking about, that quiet time in nature. You know, I was reading recently about the uh, really innovative scientists and some of the ways that they do that. And they say, <clears throat> It's from the quiet time. It's from, however, they, it's from shutting down the mind and all the chatter. It, um, for many yeah. scientists, it's not That's that they don't know time. how to think. Yeah. yeah, it's not that for many scientists, it's not that they don't know how to think. It's not, it's that they don't know how to quit thinking, how to shut the mind down and let this non cognitive, mm. intuitive, synthetic part of their being come come about. And yes, and back to your question, you know, for me, always being in nature was so stimulating in the sense that you were talking about in a very, very creative sense, without actually sitting there trying to think about things and so forth. I also found too, as I was going along, when I was stumbled by a problem, I, I made a point of having that challenge in my mind when I went to sleep. And when I'd wake up in the morning, I would have I would have a solution to that. And I think it was just shutting down all the chatter and letting that non-cognitive, intuitive, synthetic part of being be able to take over. And then in the morning, there it was, you know, whereas when I'm awake and the mind's going on it, it wasn't getting me anywhere. So I can very much relate to what you're talking about. I think it's, it's absolutely the case. There's a wonderful quote from Einstein about that, and I can't remember it exactly, so I'm not going to try to butcher it here, but he's talking about the distinction between the intuitive part where the creativity flows from and the mind and uh, <clears throat> making the distinction. And the mind is a tool, and if we use it as a tool, it can be very, very, uh, very important and very powerful. But when it's going nonstop, chatter, 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 it's not of much value to us, actually. It's, it's uh, realizing the relationship between this non-cognitive, intuitive, synthetic part of our being where creativity comes from. And then the mind does something that can work with that. And I guess that's where a lot of those quotes come where like, I'm just going to sleep on it or less is more comes from, you know, those, that, that ability to just park an idea to the back of the mind and let it solve itself and uh, that quiet time. And I think in a world where there is just so many notifications and noises and emails and things dragging us from one meeting to another, it's very hard to get that, 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 that space. And I was on a farm with a regenerative farmer once and he mentioned that it wasn't a good day when he moved the cattle, if he didn't sit after moving them and watch them for at least three to four hours, just to see which leaves I would go into first, which, cattle was following who, you know, what was, you know, the kind of behavior between this pasture and that pasture. And he said that he got so much more feedback in that sitting down and watching than what any, you know, other form of educational things could tell him. So I thought that was really interesting, but yet we live in a world where we're pulled to notifications and red dots on our devices for, you know, who wants yeah, our attention. Yeah, so absolutely next. the case. And I think these are such good points that are being made of that, you know, take the time to, to uh, sl stop, slow down and, and, and uh, participate. Be, be in, be actually in the world and be where you are. Like the, the farmer that you were talking about takes the time and it's amazing how much a person learns um, by doing what he was doing. Certainly, all of the research that we did was motivated by, by that, by, by spending time watching animals, plants, thinking about what might be going on, then reflecting on that, and then, uh, in our case, asking questions that we could do research on. Yeah, I love that. And, and I, I know I've read parts of your book. I haven't read all of it. And I know Hugo from Farming Secrets, who you've met 
in Australia, I'm not sure if you remember, but when you came to Australia many, many, many years ago, over a decade, probably, um, you met Helen and Hugo and uh, they're very big fans. And that's how, you know, I kind of got to know with what you were talking about. And, and Hugo will always send me little bookmarks from your, from your book. But if there was like one key takeaway that someone needed to really get transferred from your book and your brain and your wisdom into their brain. And we can do that in this form of audio podcast. What would that, what would that be that kind of is that aha moment that people need to kind of hit them in the face and go, Oh, this is why this is so important. Again, before I answer that question, let me just say, I, my family and I spent a year in Australia back in 91, 92. I did a sabbatical in Armadale, which is in New South, South Wales, just, little boys yep. north and inland from where you are in Sydney right now. It was a wonderful, wonderful year. And uh, I've been back to Australia many, many, many times since then. And I just can't say enough good things about the people that I met and got to know there in Australia. It's, you know, the, the best, just, just wonderful, wonderful memory. So I want, I want to make that clear of so many people. Awesome. Um, I think... Okay. Yeah, that's a good question you ask. It's kind of a big question. I think <clears throat> what strikes me more and more is the, the interrelationships amongst the, the creatures on this planet and then the links between the physical and the metaphysical facets. And as, as the book goes on, as nourishment goes on, it moves from plant and animal behavior and so forth into this realms of uncertainty and then mystery and moves more and more from the physical into the metaphysical. And I think, you know, if we could link back our, our ancestors not that long ago, all of our ancestors, you know, we often talk in, in the US and you do in Australia too of the indigenous peoples that, that were uh, on the continents for many, many generations, but all of us were indigenous to place not that long ago. And I, I often think of their relationships with the soil with the plants and the diversity of plants, with the animal species and the human, and then the spiritual, how those weren't separate for those people, how, how they were all integrated one thing with the next. And uh, I'm working on an audio version, audio adaptation of nourishment. It doesn't have the detail of nourishment, but it's got the big picture in a very, very powerful way. It's updated and so forth. But this point that I'm talking about now is really central all the way through through the book of this relationship between our visit here, our momentary visit to Earth and the beauties, wonders, horrors, mysteries, deep, you know, deep mysteries and, and so forth of this visit. And then our relationship with the spiritual is really integrated throughout that in ways that certainly nourishment did, but in ways that build on that as well. So I think it's those interrelationships and I would say anything um, that <clears throat> I did that was worth, quote, I, quote, I did that was worthwhile during my, the years that I was working at Utah State University and working on the book, it was all came out of relationships with other folks. I take no credit in that sense, you know, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. all these interrelationships with one another that I think is what, what, um, all the wonderful things emerge from those kind of interrelationships. So I see myself simply as a node in interrelationships uh, that are here and now, and then in the, the spiritual domain as well. Mm, amazing. And I think also with the amount of, you know, being connected is one thing physically, but now we have all this technology that isn't the same physical connection, but it, exactly for like, and I'm a big believer of like biodiversity of people and brains and wisdom and human spirit and souls. So like being able to connect with different people on a zoom call, there's eight or nine different people from all around the world. You're not only getting like localized wisdom, but you're getting global wisdom. So solving problems, I think these days can be fast tracked in a way where we are speaking a very similar language. It amazes me that things were invented in the past and there was no Google to Google how something works to help you innovate. You know, you really needed to rely on your local network. Um, and I, you know, wonder how many times the same thing was invented in different parts of the world, maybe just slightly different without any form of communication, you know, and um, now we're just so connected, but we 
feel disconnected in a really weird way, you know? Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah. I know it's a weird kind of condom kind of space that we're in. Um, but um, I, I do know that it's, and even COVID as bad as it was, it did bring communities back together again. It reminded people to check in with their values and who they were being and what was important on their list of values. And so I see you nodding your head. Do you want to speak to that as well? Oh, I think it, absolutely the case. It caused us to stop and have a think about it, huh? have a think about the, the craziness yeah. of our lives. I think uh, it seems to me to the, the mass exodus of people out of some of the large cities and stuff into the rural landscapes and into the parks and, and so forth that's taken place during and since COVID is a reflection of that. And some of the people that live in rural or areas feel a little bit overwhelmed by all the folks that are coming either to visit or to live there. But uh, I, I and I appreciate that. But you can understand that they're thinking about, well, what does matter? What is quality of life? What the, the, some of the things that we're talking yeah. about right now, I think really it's stopped people and made them think about that, the, the importance of family and and community and connection with 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 one another uh so it was a good thing in that sense seems like to me yeah love that and 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 speaking to the nourishment and the cycle of food and being really connected from you know i think you must be excited because i am as well about the studies that are happening now from soil biology all the way to the gut biome and even you know links to mental health and how all that nourishment kind of moves through the food chain um how do you feel we are progressing on that movement? Do you feel that big, like big food companies that are creating very highly processed food will hijack that research and make us eat highly processed food? Or do you think people's intuition will win and we know that raw, real food is what really is going to keep us nourished and surviving and thriving? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Well, well, well put. I, I, think what's happening now with whichever whatever term a person wants to use regenerative agriculture or conservation agriculture the whole movement though toward uh looking at the uh, how our health is linked with soil with plant diversity with animal diversity i i just think that's a wonderful wonderful movement um and getting people thinking about where does our food come from and thinking about nutrient density and phytochemical richness of foods and that that's really fundamental for health. I think that's, it can't say enough good about the importance of that movement and getting us grounded and centered again on where, you know, what's absolutely fundamental to life and to the health, not only our health, but the health of the communities that nourish us the natural community. So I think that's wonderful. I, uh, you know, you ask about <clears throat> big, big food companies and so forth and what might happen. I think in a positive sense in this way, there's a company here in the States called Whole Foods. And I don't know if you've heard about it. It, it was, it came about many, many years ago and their emphasis was on organic and healthy foods and so forth. And, you know, for years and years, they were running and gunning, just going, going great guns. But in the last several years, they've really, they've really uh, had a hard go of it. And the reason is that all the big food stores really took over. They realized people, people are very interested in being able to buy organic foods and trying to get, get more wholesome foods. And so some of the big box stores took the wind out of out of whole the sales of Whole Foods, and I, you know, I credit Whole Foods with what they were doing, and don't necessarily think that's wonderful what happened with them. But it, you know, in a good sense, though, you can go to many of the stores that would have never thought about organic or you know where foods are coming from that that are really have big sections now that that feature those kinds of foods um so i guess some good can come out of that too but when it comes to the ultra processed foods i uh, i just think that it's not a good place to go for for people i, I think you know sticking with wholesome foods thinking about where those foods are coming from fruits vegetables meats 
and trying to get the, the most nutrient dense foods that, that are possible is, is really the way to go. There's a lot that's, that's coming to the forefront and has over the last few years about um, the plant-based meats and so forth, and lots being written. And I find myself very often being asked to review scientific papers that are written uh, studies about those. And uh, it's very interesting to see how all that's evolving. But in some of the studies, without going into to particulars, the, the, uh, the, uh, the ultra-processed plant-based foods aren't showing up to be nearly so great as what people touted them to be, actually. Mm. And we're starting to see a lot of those reports here in Australia as well, different news agencies reporting on that. Maybe it's not as planet positive as what maybe everyone thought it was to be. And, you know, yeah, <laughs> nothing's more processed easy than our bodies and something that's been grown for, you know, millions of years and that people have been eating for generations on top of generations. Bringing this new processed food, I think even though it might be great for the short term, we don't know what the long-term generational change will be if the body's processing these foods, you know, maybe it's seeing some of these compounds as foreign objects and storing them away somewhere. And then, you know, 10 years down the track, we see different uh, forms of uh, disease or, or things pop up that we haven't seen. And we won't even know that until time has passed. And sometimes prevention is better than cure, I guess. Yeah, um, lots and, of and that's what I, I worry effects. about is, one can think this as well, too, Ray. Um, you know, when we were doing studies of plants and the chemistry of plants and which what influences what animals select of plants, we had to be so incredibly careful of how we, how we worked with the plants and the plant materials, because the minute you pick a plant, you start to change it chemically. Now, think that same thing's occurring when you harvest peas, when you pick broccoli, when you pick cauliflower, when you pick an iceberg lettuce, whatever you're doing, you're changing it chemically. And the quality starts to go down, 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 the longer it has to be transported, the longer it sits on the shelf. And then you think, okay, so that's influencing the nutritional uh, characteristics. Then you think, well, how was that plant raised? Was it raised in industrial agriculture that's using artificial fertilizers, that's using herbicides and pesticides of various sorts, or was it raised in a regenerative way? And what varieties were being raised? All those things are influencing the phytochemical richness of the plants, which is influencing the flavor. You know, so many of the foods that we eat here in the States and probably in Australia as well, they look great on the shelf, but they have absolutely no flavor. And the reason is the varieties yep. we select for, the ways that we grow those foods, the soils that they're grown in. And when they have no flavor, that's the body through these metabolically mediated feedbacks that we studied so much of over 35 years, simply the body saying that there's nothing here nutritionally. It's a no wonder it's hard to get kids to eat their fruits and vegetables when they have absolutely no flavor or no nutritional uh, density and richness. On the other hand, if you have foods that are grown, uh, good varieties grown on, on fertile soils and rich, the richness of flavor, you don't, have to, you don't have to fight kids to eat that. They love it. The flavors are fantastic body saying this is good this is good for cells and organ systems including the microbiome yeah absolutely and seasonality as well making sure that that vegetable or that fruit grew in the season that it was intended to grow and not forced by artificial lights or you know inputs um but i guess the big movement has been well that's okay the food's not as nourishing we'll just uh supplement with some tablets or mighty vitamins and superpower waters and things like that uh, does the body process those type of nutrients? Like, can these problems be fixed by having poor food, but just supplement it with a tablet or a drink or a syrup to, to, to fill that gap? You know, that's certainly what we do. And that's multi-billion dollar business and makes us feel good maybe about eating not so good quality foods and so forth. But I think Certainly, there are cases when a body can be deficient in a particular nutrient, and a supplement at that point or some food that's very high in that can be worthwhile. 
But otherwise, I think there are many more downsides to supplements than there are upsides. And so I'm, I'm fairly critical of, of supplements and taking supplements. I think a person is much better eating wholesome foods that contain tens of thousands of these compounds, including the supplemental nutrients. You know, one thing a per person must realize is that these compounds don't operate in isolation. So imagine that you take supplemental omega-3 fatty acids or supplemental uh, calcium or whatever it is. It's the relationships or supplemental vitamin Cs. That's a good, a good one. It's the interrelationships amongst these different compounds and cofactors that come along with those that really are what contribute to health. And so the more you purify and isolate and focus on individual compounds, uh, the less effect that you're going to get from taking supplement. You're much better to get, I hope that makes sense. You're much better to get the nutrients you need in complex forms with many, many other um, compounds that are complementing one another within individual foods and then within combinations of foods. Um, that That's where health comes from. I that is definitely something that I see a, a common pattern of is not zooming out and seeing the many parts that make the whole, you know, we go, Oh, this has got the vitamin C, but we don't realize that vitamin C needs all these other compounds. And as you refer to them as complex kind of like complex particles of, of a whole, it's the same as like the juice movement, you know, juicing everything and having all the fructose and throwing out all the fiber. It's like, no, 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 we need the fiber in order for the fructose to be kind of absorbed and cancel each other out. And, you know, it might seem like we're doing the healthy choice, but we, we're, you would never be able to sit there and eat seven apples in their whole form. So how could we drink seven apples of juice form, you know, so in one sitting. So, you know, zooming out and seeing the many parts of the whole, I think is a very, um, and we see this in soil as well, where there could be minerals in the soil, but it's locked because there's another mineral missing. And as soon as that mineral or fungi or bacteria appears, it unlocks this part of the soil because the environment is, is, is right. And it's the same with our food and our gut biome and our bodies and biological systems in general. Yes, that example that you gave with the soil too made me think about a study that was published late last year. It's long-term work that's being done in Minnesota. And I think this study uh, has been going for 23 years. And what they were doing is looking at the characteristics of soil where there were many, many different species of plants, I think 16 different species growing in combination versus each of those plants growing in monoculture. And what they showed was that the, the amount of organic matter, the amount of minerals in the soil and the plants was greatly, greatly enhanced with diversity of different plant species as opposed to monocultures of species. And so that supports ideas then in the uh, regenerative movement where people are growing cover crops of multiple different plant species. It's, it really creates, I, I often like to say that plants turn dirt into soil. And diverse mixtures of plants turn soil into homes, grocery stores, and pharmacies for diverse arrays of species above ground and below ground. That To me, that sums up so much of ecology and everything else. And it's the plant diversity that really, um, you know, it creates homes for all these jillions of different bacteria and fungi and uh, macroorganisms that live in the soil below ground and then the ones that that live above ground as well it's uh, that diversity and then you know so that could be thought of as the soil microbiome and it's creating homes for thousands of different species well when a goat or a sheep or a cow or a kangaroo or a koala or whatever you want to talk about <clears throat> eats and lives in an environment like that, its microbiome is greatly enhanced as well. I remember studies from years ago where people were pointing out when uh, livestock or wildlife species in this case ate diverse arrays of plants, their microbiomes were much richer, much more diverse in species than if they focused on, on a very narrow array of, of plant species. It's simply creating more homes in the gut 
uh, for for a variety of creatures. And I read with delight work on the, the Hadzas in Africa. People say, boy, they've got such incredible microbiomes in their gut, gut microbiomes. And the reason is that they're eating such a huge diversity of different uh, different foods, basically, creating homes, grocery stores and pharmacies for all these creatures in at all levels huh? in their gut in this particular case. And same for us. That's where I get a little bit sometimes wondering about the value of probiotics. Um, I can see them used to stimulate and inoculate, but all the work on ruminant nutrition suggests that unless you are continually creating those homes for the creatures by the diverse array of foods you eat, you, you may put in a, a probiotic, but the species may or may not survive depending on what's there for them to utilize, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you've just really, you know, you, what you're basically saying is that we have the ability to create grocery stores and pharmacies and all that in our own gut biome, if we balance it right, you know, and the reliant on stores and systems and what's external becomes less when we start nurturing, I guess, internally. And I, and, and, and even to speak to what you mentioned about before, where the biology of a plant is changed from the minute that it's picked you know, I, I often hear reports as well, and I truly believe that the intention of the grower is passed on through that seed. And, you, you know, if the grower is, or the farmer is growing this with a love and intention and nourishing the world and feeding, um, that is passed on. And if the farmer is planting because there's scarcity and they're paying bank bills and they don't know who this food's going to and they're disconnected and the supermarket chain has like pushed them down on price, then that's also passed in to the, to the vibration and the energy of the food and the whole intention of why someone's doing something. And so when you join Absolutely. all these dots together, you start, you know, really realizing how connected we need to get to all these moving parts. It's not just food on a shelf. Absolutely. And that may sound, may or may not sound strange to people, depending on what, what they, you know, thought about and, and read about and so forth. But Absolutely the case, and it makes me think of water and the work that's been done on water, and uh, it's the same sort of idea of, of uh, the, the uh, intention and, and the, the uh, I'm searching for, for the right words here, but, but it's just amazing some of the work that's been done looking at, at water and, and how water is treated and, and, uh, and so forth what kind of energy yeah. or not it carries with it then in terms of healing or not healing. And uh, yeah, you know, it, it, that's, yeah. that's important to realize. And it shows us to how much we are a part of in that sense, in my mind of nature's communities and what we do to them, we ultimately do to ourselves. Then what we do to them, we do to ourselves by nurturing yeah. them in all the forms from the water to the plants to, and so forth. We, by nurturing the, those things, we nurture ourselves. And I think that's what we so got away from as we moved from, you know, hunting and gathering and then small farms and small scale farming to, to industrial agriculture. And I don't mean to sound like, you know, like some real negative voice on industrial agriculture. Things evolve as they evolve and we, we do what we do. But I think we, we disconnected ourselves from those kind of intimate relationships in that process um, and became ultimately absolutely dependent on fossil fuels to, to grow foods and nourish ourselves and the large industrial scale models. And it seems as we were talking uh, before we started formally into the, into the podcast that um, it's really important for many, many reasons, ecologically, economically, socially, to be thinking about producing food locally and nourishing ourselves and the communities, the, the natural communities that nourish us in that sense. Get, re, recreating our, those, those nourishing relationships once again and moving back, backing away from, from the huge industrial uh, fossil fuel driven model for, for many reasons nowadays, not the least of which, <clears throat> I've been reading figures on how many barrels of oil 
we use each day here in the United States as well as globally. It's it's absolutely stunning. It's an absolutely stunning amount when you when you realize that. And then reading projections that you know it's not going to last that much longer. And then you've got natural gas going to be lasting a little longer. And then you've got coal lasting longer. But then you throw in the changing climates and all that business. It, it's definitely time to be be having a long think about what we're doing and and uh, thinking yeah. about how to move toward local and regenerative and nur- nourishing one another and the communities we inhabit with every good intention right. as you're saying yeah i love that and i couldn't agree with you more so lovers i want you to sit there and just think about that you know you know there is a little bit of doom and gloom in the in in the planet and there's floods fires droughts pandemics and everything barrels of fuel running out but Before we jump into that, we're going to take a quick break, so stick with us. Hello, soil lovers. I hope you're enjoying today's guest and this podcast, but I wanted to just let you know that when you get excited about soil, just as you're hearing about our guests, then you will want to check out the Soil Learning Centre. The Soil Learning Centre is a hub that we put together and digitalized all the content over the years that were originally on DVD into this online learning experience. So if any of our guests or any of the topics that we speak about during the podcast whet your appetite and you want to get your hands dirtier and dig deeper and get educated around different things around soil, whether it be biodynamics, permaculture, whether it be using a microscope, or whether it just be hanging out with other like-minded educators, mentors, and facilitators, then the Soil Learning Centre is a place for you to hang out and dig deeper. That's the soillearningcentre.com. We have lots of different programs, courses, and even a membership. So if you want to belong to a community of other soil lovers, then that's the place to hang out. Well, until we meet again, enjoy the rest of this podcast. Back to the program. Welcome back, all lovers. You're listening to Regen Ray and Fred Provenza. We've been talking about all things nourishment and, you know, food and connection and intention. But we sit in here, you know, being very optimistic. And Fred mentioned before the break that, you know, there are a lot more people moving to systems that are a bit more self-sufficient and thinking about where they can grow their own food and, you know, are there food shortages, I guess, you know, lurking in the in around the corner. And I guess one can only think to prepare in a way where, well, it's good if it doesn't, but if it does, at least I'm a little bit ready. Fred, before the conversation, we'll chat in a little bit about being optimistic, but also getting to this point now where we need to be a little bit realistic as well. You spoke about floods that are occurring quite locally, which I hadn't heard about. And there's been lots of floods here in Australia as well along the coast. And I believe that there's a delayed delayed response to all the effects of that. We won't see that produce not hit the supermarkets for at least six months. Um, so how can one stay optimistic, but also a little bit realistic and, and, and what should people be doing, um, whether it be mentally, because I think mental preparedness is probably a big thing than storing food on a shelf in a, in a bunker somewhere, you know, so mentally, I think as a group of people, we need to get com- comfortable with helping each other and giving a lend in hand. What are you seeing in the communities and around the world from your expertise and people you hang out with? Well, I think what you mentioned, Ray, of, um, uh... It depends on the group, actually, and it depends on the day. Sometimes I think here in the States that we're still so disconnected, so disconnected from where food comes from, where nourishing food comes from. Having said that, though, certainly in the last decade to two decades, there's been many people trying to raise levels of awareness, many different people from different kinds of backgrounds. And that's that's very encouraging. Um, And... uh, I think one of the things I think about all the time, and I'm thinking about it especially, uh, or it's really, I've been thinking about it and talking about it for at least the last decade or maybe more, is this idea that, you know, we need to start thinking about natural plant communities and what they were. We're, In the U.S., we're so used to, to our green lawns that we irrigate and fertilize and mow with the lawnmower. We spend great amounts of fossil fuel doing that, great amounts of herbicides, getting rid of of any plant that we don't like that's in, in the lawn. And I think if we could start to appreciate 
natural plant communities and the beauty of those communities and the beauty of the different plant species and turn our yards into pollinator havens in a sense as well, but also uh, get out of the fossil fuel and water loops. The native plants are there because they grow there naturally. They, they're adapted to in our case here in the in the west and the southwest to the arid conditions. Um, and then also to start thinking about growing small gardens, uh, vegetable, herbal, medicinal kinds of gardens, all those things I think put us, link us back with our roots. But also, you know, looking right now, we have two major lakes um, in the Southwest, Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Lake Mead's the largest lake in the, in the United States, the largest uh, human-made lake. They're both at 25% or less of capacity now. They're, they're like dried up, they're drying up. And they, they wow. furnish water and hydroelectric power for 20 million people across seven states and Mexico. And there, there's just the, the shortages that are taking place now and the dire measures that are being put into place. And I, I chuckle, not in a good way, but one of the first things they're talking about cutting is water for agriculture. It's like, well, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? You know, talk about people disconnected from where food comes from, which is California in this case. Not a good, not a good deal. The first thing I ought to be thinking about, well, let's shut down all the golf courses. Let's shut down no more irrigating lawns. We're going to have to go to native plant species and we're going to try to keep people in agriculture growing food that we need to, to eat and so forth. But uh, that's a reality here in the southwestern United States. That's not a theoretical kind of possibility. That's happening now in the southwest of the U.S. Uh, I said 20 million. I think I've heard estimates 40 million people across seven states, Mexico and California that are absolutely dependent on water and hydroelectric. And so that that drives the points home really quickly about how to become locally adapted to the environments that you live in, how to start appreciating native plant species, how to start thinking like our indigenous ancestors did about how to, what to grow, how to grow it in those environments to make yourself a little bit self-sufficient. And then I think as much as anything, uh, practically and spiritually to link, link you with those landscapes that you're, you're living in, not, not as, not kind of we've isolated ourselves, we've insulated ourselves from the realities that we live in because of, of modern food production and transportation and processing. You know, it takes something like uh, one to two calories to grow a calorie of food. And then when you look at processing, transporting and all the rest of that adds another 10 to 12 calories to produce one calorie of energy. Think of a wild creature out there trying to survive if it has to expend 14 calories of energy to get one calorie of energy, it's not gonna live long, is it? And neither are we with that kind of a, of a worldview. We're gonna to have to change fundamentally our relationship in that sense as all these issues with fossil fuels and changing climates and so forth uh, play out. And that reality is playing out here and probably in Australia as well with all that's going on politically geopolitically mm -hmm. across the globe. I mean, gasoline prices here are higher than they've, they've ever been in anyone's lifetime. And uh, that has huge, huge implications for everything we do from agriculture to driving cars to there's nothing the fossil fuels doesn't touch. And that's, that's another huge area where we're going to have to really have long thinks and, and make changes to the way that we do business on this planet, looks like to me anyway, without trying to be too sound too certain and trying to make too much projection. I think that's something worth it. We're needing to have big things about. Not a lot of people are for certain. Yeah, no, I definitely think that's a great, I think, yeah, there was just a moment there where you just, something hit me in the face in regards to what you said there. Like we wouldn't go to work if we had to spend $14 to make a dollar, you know, uh, it just wouldn't <laughs> make sense. You're like, well, why would I get out of bed? There's going to be a tipping point where that system just, there isn't enough resources in the front end to help the back end execute. And I think that's a really interesting thing to sit with, especially with the soil lovers listening and go, you, you know, just to understand that there is a lot more energy that goes into the food system than what actually feeds us and the energy that we get out of it. So there's 
any mathematical formula or any kind of logicness will show that that seesaw is out of balance and it's going to give one day, you know, and maybe we've had time as an, as a, as a blessing, but I feel like there is, you know, that, that time is running shorter and shorter and, and, um, oh, you know, absolutely so, right. Yeah, you know, there's a very life. interesting article, uh, that I'll pass along to you that you can put on, on the website with it linked with this about that, about that whole topic. It's published in a journal called ecological wow. economics. And just, it, it's a very, very, it's a fairly long paper, but it's, it's a very, very good overview of what we're talking about right now in the broadest sense, talking about ecologically, ecological, uh, behavioral, and uh, practical kind of economic implications of, of all our utter dependence on, on fossil fuels. You know, that point that, that you're coming back to related to f- wouldn't spend $14 to come to work and make $1. You know, people who study plant behavior and animal behavior very much study these kind of things, the economics of decision-making in plants and animals. And it's very much about optimization and, uh, and how plants and animals go about doing that. So if a person is, is interested in ecology and comes up through those disciplines, you get steeped very, very strongly in how plants and animals optimize in order to make their living because they don't have, they don't have fossil fuels to supplement, right? They've got to do it on what nature provides. And that's where they become incredible models for how to mm. how to make a living in the environments that they're in. And so we can, again, we can learn from, from the plants and the animals about these sort of fundamental ecological relationships that we broke away from momentarily with, with fossil fuels, um, but that we're gonna, we're gonna end up being circled back. It's just stunning. Uh, like I say, the amount of fossil fuels, I'm trying to think, and I should, this figure should be right on top of my, my mind. Um, I think in the US, we use something like 20 million barrels of oil a day. I think um, the world, it's 100 million barrels a day. Just think of those figures. It's just stunning to think about how much and then uh, to, to read how much people estimate is, is available still and when it's going to be running out. And of course, far before it runs mm-hmm. out, the price of it's just, I mean, we're already talking about the economics of the industrial food production system, and that doesn't work at all now. And that paper really makes that point. But as it gets more and more scarce, then those economics just get worse and worse and worse, cost more and more to extract and purify, extract and purify those oil and so forth. And so the economics just get uglier and uglier as, as we go along. So thinking in a regenerative sense as we are, and then thinking even beyond that too. I remember years ago reading a book titled The Long Emergency. And uh, it was really a wake up for me. Uh, I remember our daughter was living in Chicago at the time, working in a commodity brokerage firm, living in a high rise. And at the, in the at night, You'd look over Chicago, it was this beautiful thing. And I'm reading this book and just thinking, there is nothing (laughs) that I'm looking at, nothing around here that's not absolutely tied to fossil fuels. And if all this guy's talking about in this book is coming to pass, boy, we are, this is not going to work. It was beautiful for a blink of an eye, but it's not going to, it's not going to last. There's no way, you know, so... And I'm not meaning that to sound negative in any way. It's just reflecting and and something, you know, it's part of, I think, what you were saying. We we need to be thinking about different scenarios. And if that scenario is one that has any possibility and probably has some pretty good possibility, then we need to be thinking about how, how, how to move into that in the future. Without fossil fuels, this conversation that I'm absolutely loving wouldn't be happening either, you know, and there's a things of how many businesses rely on the internet and power and, you know, things to operate. And um, if they do stop even for, you know, a little bit, um, it's, it's, it's not, it's not great for anyone. And I think, you know, having, you know, it's not about being a prepper, but it's about just being kind of aware of what's going on and what, you know, I often am really blown away with the fact that most people don't realize that, the current money system that we have has only really operated 
for 50 years because in 71, it got taken off the gold standard. So before that, it was linked to gold. And now we're only in a 50-year-old system. And we're st- I would say we're still trying to work out how this money system works. And it's likely that it could collapse or it could hit a point where it needs to be adjusted or levers need to be turned. It's only 50 years old. Like one generation hasn't even gone through this system, you know? And so we have to be aware of that. And that's a lot. You know, I like shedding light on those conversations. And I love what you said about before with nature having to optimize to survive. And I know there was this video um, where they put, they put a map of Japan and they put little oat, oats uh, where all the major cities were and the fungi went out and like found these oats and then built stronger connections to where the food source was because the oats was a food source to the fungi and the fungi actually optimized Japan's rail system better than what humans and engineers could. And so this fungi actually found pathways over the map that were the shortest distance or the more accurate distance to get people or train lines developed, you know, and this is fungi, you know, and so we, you know, this is another example of, of where nature optimizes much better than what humans can because there's no emotion or uh, other things in a way. It's just survival and thriving, you know, so oh, left without any human intervention. The case. And that takes me back to what I was saying too about all the work done on optimization in plants and animals. And, and it, it's amazing. And I say this not, 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 um, not in any flippant way, but the intelligence of, of, of all these creatures and uh, so much has been studied about that. So it's not, one can look at that very detailed kind of, of for with plants, for example, plant physiological kinds of, of um, biochemical uh, kind of studies that, that really talk about plant intelligence, plant learning and behavior. It, it's, that's a fascinating area all to its own. Same with bacteria. I was just, reading a bunch about bacteria and fungi and uh, how genes plus organisms plus environment plus chance, you just can't, can't, you can't beat them. They're, they're so clever. They're so absolutely clever. It's no wonder then you get antibiotic resistance, you get herbicide resistant, and uh, herbicide resistant plants. They're, they're sharp. They're clever. Mm. Absolutely. Well, Fred, this has been absolutely great. Uh, I want to ask our signature question and i just wanted to make you embody the soil and really give our soil a voice. So are you ready to become the voice of, of the soil? Sure. Sure. Excellent. So if you, if, if you could tell everyone on the planet and maybe even beyond because soils seeming to expand beyond planet at the moment, but what would you say as a voice of the soil to all of us? I love diversity. I love diversity is what I would say. I love diversity above ground. I love the plants that make me healthy. I love diversity below ground with all the organisms that are able to survive when there's diversity of plants above ground. I love diversity and then diversity of large creatures whose um, urine and feces provide life to me as well. I, I love diversity. I think is what I would say. And I I would say, I think humans should take that to heart too. This whole notion that, that diversity really is the heart of creativity and embracing, embracing differences rather than everything. Sameness is boring. Diversity is what's, and it seems to me that people say nature abhors a vacuum. I think what nature abhors is sameness. Nature thrives on diversity and creativity, ever in the process of, of co-creating, co-creating. So that, yeah. that's, those Love would that. be my thoughts as, as kind of, quote, so, so, soil. <laughs> I don't know. I often think I, if I could do one, be, do one thing before I leave this planet, and I know it's impossible, I would love to, to have the experience of what it's like to be different creatures. What's it like to be Ray for five minutes? What's it like to be one of those plants that's mm. in on your screen for five minutes? What's it like to be a bacteria in the soil for five minutes? I think if we could do that, it would so mm. expand our minds, blow our minds, and probably utterly change the way that we 
we think about the whole world, you know, because we're, we're always projecting, mm -hmm. but what's it actually like to be, to be a member of the soil or whatever it would be? Uh, that's what, but uh, I wish that were possible, actually. <laughs> Uh, it sounds, I think there's nothing, you know, they say seeing is believing or moving something from knowledge to experience, you know, so we have all this knowledge on how a plant functions, but I think you're right. If we could transform into a plant and go, oh my God, we got this so wrong <laughs> from an external yeah, point it? of view. This is not what just, happens. This is what happens. You know? <laughs> just imagine, right? If you could, yeah, exactly. You're putting it into words. Imagine if you could and just yeah, and probably all, all you need is five minutes to, you know, to have your mind just totally blown, blown away of the experience of being a plant. Yeah, that's that's kind of the bummer of what when you do visit visit the planet, you're you're in one form, right? And no matter how much you try to empathize or relate with some with another person or whatever it is, you still you're still not that creature, huh? Yeah, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you, we come back as a different form and maybe you need to experience the full start to end life form. Maybe five minutes isn't enough. I don't know, but right, I, I love that right. thinking. And I, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, may, maybe, maybe this will happen in another, another life form. Well, Fred, it has been absolute a pleasure hanging out with you. You've attended lots of workshops, lots of webinars, lots of video content. So people can definitely Google your name and find out more content about you, but is there a specific place you mentioned your book? Like, where can people hang out with you more personally? Where are you hanging out these days? Well, the the book nourishment, the audio book will probably be out um, by this late summer or fall. And uh, you know, I hate to toot my own horn and everything, and but but I think the uh, for people, I, I've had people in Australia write to me, and and one letter I, I'm thinking about now was from a wonderful lady, and said, "Look, my husband's read the book; he just loves it." But she said, "I've got kids; I I work from sun up to sundown. I there's no way I can read read a book, your book. I can't, you know. There's no way I can stay awake. Will you please do an audio book?" So. I think the the audio book is going to be nice in in that sense of not needing to sit down. And nourishment's not necessarily an easy book to get through. There's a lot of particulars in there. The audio book's going to be much more big picture of the whole. It's got the essence in there, but it's big picture. So that'll be. Uh, and when that comes out, Ray, I'll shoot you uh, links to to that and so forth. Awesome. And I'm really excited because I'm an audio person and video as uh, the podcast and video podcast suggests. So I I'm very uh, keen to, to hear the audio experience of it. And, um, you know, I feel like it gives me a bit, are you narrating it as well? Well, you know, we're having a lot of conversation about that. I would like to have music in that book. I think music is such a powerful medium if it's done appropriately I would also like to have maybe more than one narrator where um, to just to make it uh, keep it interesting, you know, keep 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 lots coming there. So we'll see how that turns out. We're, we're talking about those kind of things right now, though. I always love a book that's narrated by the author. I feel like you get the heart authentic experience. It's, again, that intention of you the author knows the words they put on those pages and read it from authenticity rather than a. Uh, a, 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 a talent who's just reading words on a page. Um, so, you know, but shared, shared responsibilities for different areas. I think that's great. But as long as we hear your voice, I would be very happy um, because yeah, I okay, think that. Good. That's um, your timing's yeah. perfect, Ray, on that. Actually, that's, and um, that's encouraging to hear what you're saying. I, I was leaning a little bit toward, you know, professionals do such a great job and so forth. So that that's good to hear which you, <laughs> that tips me the the I other way a little bit. Of, I've got 120 audio books in my phone, and I can assure you that I get the best experience when uh, uh, we, I hear. And maybe soil lovers can write in and you know share with Fred and others. But I think authentically coming from the author, and even having permission to go off script. You know, I there's a there's a book that I've got, and I love the fact that the audio version has like updated little tips and go. Well, now in 2020, I would have said this and this. You know, so I uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I love that. So. Well, that's I'm what excited. we're doing with this adaptation. Yeah, 
that's what we're doing with this adaptation actually too, is really updating on things that were written. You know, Nourishment was published in 2018, the end of the year. And so it's a good chance to update and reflect. It'll be, you know, it's, it's the same ideas and big picture, but it, it's got some nice, nice updates and reflections and stuff. I, I think that that will be good and, and way big picture in terms of the story. So also love as there you go. You're hearing it first with decision-making live on the call. So that's, you know, what podcasting is all about. It's all from the heart and not from the head. I love doing this for this one reason is that we get to have an th- authentic conversation and there's no over planning and no overthinking. So Fred, thank you very much for coming here and sharing your wisdom, your heart, your soul, and, and everything that you've done uh, up until now and excited for the next few chapters. Yes. And thanks to you, Ray, too. I very much appreciate what you're saying and the conversation we had, the yarn that we had and the, the, the notion from the heart and not from the head and, uh, spontaneous was wonderful wonderful to be with you we finally got it done it took a while but we finally got it done oh it's all perfect you know maybe we needed to have the book conversation and that's why the universe made it happen today well so lovers that's enough from me until next time make sure that you get outside get your hands dirty and keep digging deeper into our wonderful world of soil Well, so lovers, that's enough secrets for one episode. I really hope that you enjoyed all the secrets shared during this conversation. But hey, let's not keep it a secret. Please share this podcast around and make sure that you like it and leave us a review because that really helps spread the secrets of the soil. Until next time, remember, get outside, get your hands dirty and keep digging deeper into your soils.